So here's a little secret. Software engineering is so much more than coding. And honestly, the more senior you get, for some reason, the less code you actually write. But that means you can be way more effective. But also you're spending a lot of time writing JIRA tickets and unblocking other members of your team and debugging things. And coding is actually the easy part of all of this. Anyway, I was completely self-taught. And so I was a little bit surprised to learn that coding was really not the difficult thing about becoming a software engineer. So I read a lot of books on coding as well. I had to learn that too but also a lot of books outside of that that were maybe a little bit meta about how to actually become a good coder. So here are the top five books that really helped me in my software engineering career. And they didn't help me just as I was starting out. They actually helped me a lot over time as I was thinking about whether I wanted to pursue a staff engineer path and a manager path. I think these books can apply to anyone, people coming from physics, computer science in all stages of their career. So the first book I'll recommend is a book called Clean Code. So this book generally covers good practices of clean code. But remember, your company may not follow all these standards exactly. So really listen to what your standards are at your company. But it's actually a really good introduction to the beginnings of clean code. So good variable names, good code structure, good software architecture, and it actually goes into case studies of good clean code practices, which I really enjoyed. So when I first became an engineer in my first one-on-one -on -one meeting with my manager, the first thing we talked about was actually clean code and commenting properly. One big thing at my company, the standard that we had is that comments should really not rot and they should protect us from that. So for example, you don't want to say on your comments what the code is doing because that may change. What the comments should really explain was the decisions behind what this code is doing and the contract between this code and other pieces of code. So you know what the code is supposed to expect and that should not rot. If the code is so confusing that you do have to explain line by line what the code does, well, maybe you should actually redo the code because maybe that's not the cleanest code in the world just in terms of the logic. But really the important part here is explaining those decisions that were made and what the code expects in and expects out. So I'm a physicist. So a lot of the code I wrote before becoming a real software engineer was code that pretty much only I would read or some poor grad student that was coming in after me would have to deal with that I didn't care about because I was already gone. I wouldn't have to touch the code again. However, once I moved into a software engineering career, that all changed because the code had to be readable by other people and also myself when I came back to it in six months and forgot what it had done. So one example of this is I had a very complex project I was working on. There was a lot of decisions that we had to make through the code. And there are a few ways I could approach this code, functional and procedural. First, when I designed the code, I was making it very procedural. And that's something I think physicists struggle a lot when they move into software engineering. You're kind of looking at the algorithm as steps and the logic as steps, and you're going, first I do A, then B, then C. You know, it doesn't really matter. Maybe B and C can be done at the same time, but you choose to do it in a certain way. And it's very step by step, just moving along the pathway. When you're actually in software engineering, you kind of want to approach things from a more functional perspective. And this is something I never really heard before when I first moved into software engineering. I was used to doing the procedural method of coding and I didn't have a name for it. So this is really a whole new way of thinking. So even though you could do the steps A, B, C, D, maybe if you do step D and B at the same time, it actually gives you more code clarity. And then you can write a comment talking about the design decisions and what decisions are being made in the code at that point in time. And this will make it easier to debug later on and understand what's actually going on and why you're doing these complex steps. This way, the logic was clustered together where it needed to be. So if there was a bug in the future and I knew it was in a specific field, it was updated just in one place in the code. So I knew it had to be somewhere around there, which made it a lot easier than if I did it more of the procedural way. So this book really helped me with understanding that and the difference between code structure. So I started reading this book really early on because actually it taught me a lot of things that as a self-taught engineer, I didn't know. And it has really helped me along my entire career going from just simple things like variable names, but all the way up to good testing, good architecture practices. So I'd really recommend this for anyone in their career. Another book I'll recommend is called Working with Legacy Code. When I first started my software engineering journey, I joined a company where the company was about five years old. And so the oldest code was five years old. And I thought it was kind of hilarious that this was considered legacy code because in my past, I had worked with Fortran and probably 30 year old code before. But I think it's absolutely hilarious that we consider five year old code legacy code. But no, as it turns out, legacy code has nothing to do about the age. 
Legacy code, what it has to do with is inheriting code that other people wrote. And what I really liked about this book is that it talked about starting out with tests because then you can verify how the code works, how you think it works, without maybe too much struggle and too much frustration later on when you're designing something. Test-driven development is super good and super important when it does happen and it has helped me a lot in my career. So I've never regretted writing tests first. I've only regretted not writing tests first. If you're new to software engineering, you've probably never worked in code that was super complex before. You've probably worked in some small group projects or maybe integrated something in, but if you haven't worked in a big professional company, you're probably new to this sort of complexity. And so we all have to learn how to work with this legacy code. I always enjoy asking my coworkers questions like, why did we do this five years ago? What was the reason? And more often than not, the answer was, oh, well, we didn't really think about it. And the behavior and the logic that we thought of at the beginning doesn't really work nowadays. Sometimes there are good reasons for writing it that way, but sometimes there really were not. But I like asking that question because then we can really consider whether it's worth refactoring that and going through it. And again, those people that worked on that code five years ago also may not remember why things were done a certain way or the logic behind it. One of the best reasons I've heard with why the code was a certain way is my CTO said, well, that's how I keep my job and that's how I have job security and I'll just jump ship after 10 years and leave you all in the mire that I've created. And I'm just kidding, everyone writes code that they regret. I actually wrote a patch on a Friday afternoon at 5 p.m., 6 p.m hot fix that to production at like 7 p.m. And then six months later, someone discovered this terrible patch that I did and it looked completely awful. And even though it's maybe not the most elegant solution, well, it worked at the time, we really needed to get it out. And actually the cleaner way to do it would be really complex and kind of hard to deal with. So we're gonna leave it lurking there for a little longer. Some battles in legacy code you're gonna fight and other battles in legacy code you're just not gonna touch. And I think everyone in a startup who's been working with a legacy system knows this piece of code there where it says, hey, I've already spent 15 hours trying to refactor this to make it better. It's actually way more of a pain than it looks, so don't try it. But if you do try it, make sure to record the hours you wasted here and let's just move on and leave this alone. So I really like this because it helped me dive deep into a huge code base and also teach me what battles with legacy code to fight and which ones just to not fight. Another book I'd recommend is called The Mythical Man Month, Essays on Software Engineering. Now, one of my bosses is actually friends with this author, Fred Brooks, so this book was also recommended to me very early on. One of the big points in the book is that adding engineers to a software project will actually not speed it up. And you think, wow, how can that happen? But I was shown this point really early on in my career, a project that was probably about nine months into my so first software engineering job. It was the end of quarter. We had this project that we really wanted to finish, but nobody was really assigned ownership to it. And there are about five or six cards that we needed to finish by the end of quarter. Well, we looked at it, decided, hey, we can do this in about a week. And all three of us decided to pitch in on these cards. We thought the cards really don't overlap each other. So if we can take a couple of those cards and put them all together in the end, the final card that needs to use all of that, well, we can get it done in just two days. And let me tell you, between the three of us, it still took a week. And it was a disaster. And the biggest problem here was that the communication between the team and the requirements of the project were completely off. We were all working on different parts of the project, but because the insights that we learned in our part of the project were not passed on properly to other people, and they had already started working on their part of the code, those insights didn't align and we'd have to redo the code two or three times after someone else discovered something else in one of their cards and we'd have to pull that in through all the other cards. We made it by the deadline, but we came out of the project really frustrated and really showcasing this mythical man month. Anyway, great book. We've learned great lessons. I've seen it firsthand. So take a read of it. And as we live, we learn. And this is why communication is so important in software engineering. Another book I really enjoyed is this code, The Hidden Language of Computer Hardware and Software Book. Now, this book is not a textbook or a how-to, it's more of a history of computing, especially the lower level decisions. For example, why are computers done in binary? You know, we have 10 digits, why don't we use that? Why are we doing zero and one? And as someone that studied physics and knew a little bit about electronics, I really enjoyed connecting that hardware side to the software side. It helped me become a better engineer because I worked with performance algorithms and, you know, I'm a little closer to the hardware in my own work. 
I loved reading about the full history of computing and all those decisions and kind of building that intuition to how the upper level software worked and kind of the history that it took for us to realize what will work best nowadays. I think sometimes one of the dangers of coding and why I don't like languages like Python sometimes is that there's too much magic. And I think books like this help me demystify some of these things. Now, this isn't a textbook, it's just kind of a fun read, but I enjoy things like the Computer History Museum and learning a lot about ENIAC and all those old computer systems and the history of the people who actually created our modern world. I mean, when you think about it, computing is us putting electricity in sand and teaching it how to think, and it's kind of cool. So yeah, I would really recommend this book just for a fun read. Now, the last book I wanna recommend is called The Manager's Path. Now, if you're a junior engineer, don't click away just yet. I promise there's actually good lessons in this book for you. When I started reading this book, I wasn't a manager or anywhere close to it, but I still learned a lot of lessons here. A lot of this book is about communication, and what I took out of this book is how I can actually communicate better with my manager so they can help me in my code work and in my career. When I started software engineering, I really underestimated how much communication played a role in becoming a good software engineer. And that includes verbal communication, talking to your manager, giving status updates, asking for feedback from your manager as well, and how to ask for proper feedback. So even if the manager is somewhat new and maybe doesn't know how to give feedback, you can ask for it in the right way. But also it'll teach you a lot about written communication and what kind of status updates to provide and how you can say if you're stuck or lost instead of having your manager kind of guess where you are. And if you do want to become a team lead or do strategic technical things, well, this book is going to help you get started and you might as well start practicing those things nowadays and figuring out what your communication style is. Now, these are the books that I found most helpful in my career when I just started and recommendations that I got from my managers that hopefully will help you. So let me know if you've read any of these books, if you liked them or not. Tell me if they didn't help you. I want to know that as well. And any other books that you think other software engineers coming into the field will find helpful. And please like this video. I'd really appreciate it. It really helps me out a lot.